Here in chapters 46 and 47, we're going to see both the cause and the effect of idolatry. Now, this is a warning to all of us today. You know, I love reading the Bible because even though, you know, it's it's obviously much of it history, uh, there's a lot of prophecy in it. And this prophecy applies to each and every one of us today. And I believe that chapters 46 and 47 Isaiah are a warning to every single one of us, uh, especially America. What we're seeing happening in Babylon and what they were caught up in is very similar to what we're seeing in America today. Uh, and I believe that as Amer America is as guilty of idol worship and denying God uh, and forsaking him for all the worldly pleasures as the great nation of Babylon was. And God destroyed them in a night. So pretty interesting to see how God handled them. And it also gives us insight as to how God deals with nations that do not walk with him, nations that deny him, nations that make priority out of things that are not him. The Bible tells us that God is a jealous God, and boy, he is, because if he does not get the, the praise and the adoration and the worship that he is so deserving of, and rather our times and energies are invested, or I should say spent in that vernacular, on things that are not God-honoring, God will have his justice and his vengeance. You know, fighting against God just doesn't work. Not a great idea. Verse 1 of chapter 46 says, Bel. Bel bows down. Now, we know that Bel was the chief deity of the Babylonians. So they worshipped Bel, which, by the way, is the root word of Belzebub, which is another word for Satan. Uh, but this Bel is their main idol. Uh, and it says Nebo. Nebo then was the god of science and of learning. So Bel was the chief deity, the chief god of the Babylonians, and Nebo was the god of science and learning. These gods, however, needed animals and people to carry them around. You see in the end of verse 1, it says the images that are carried about are burdensome, a burden for the weary. Now, if these, if Babylon, for example, was going to take their gods into battle, what chapter 46 verse 1 is suggesting and saying is, look, if, if you want to take your God into battle, you got to strap it onto the back of a cart, and, and then you're going to need a donkey or a horse or something to bring it with you. And so your gods, because you've wrapped them in gold, gold being very heavy, uh, and other metallic substances like, like um, silver, it says that these idols are burdensome. Now, this is the physical use of the word burdensome, meaning you have to carry them yourself. Now, he goes on to say, they stoop down and they bow down together, unable to rescue the burden. They themselves go off into captivity. So here they are. They've got no power at all. These gods cannot save themselves, let alone save other people. Yet we serve a God who doesn't need to be carried around. We serve a God who lifts up us, lifts us up and carries us around and takes our burden on his shoulders. So there couldn't be a greater contrast between the God we serve and the gods that these Babylonians were serving. Okay, how is that applicable to today? Well, today we burden ourselves, usually in, in modern day times, we burden ourselves with debt. Uh, we take on debt, we take on things that we desperately want and feel like we should have them now. And so we we buy houses bigger than we can afford and we buy cars we don't need and, and we go on lavish vacations so we can post pictures of it on Facebook and make all of our friends jealous. Uh, meanwhile, going deeper and deeper and deeper into debt. So we have these burdens of finance. And now we have to work 12, 14, 15 hours a day to pay for the burdens. And in this, Satan is winning. See, one of the reasons that God says not to go into debt is he knows that debt is a burden, and he knows that the more debt you have, the harder you're going to have to work to pay that debt, and the less time you're going to have available for working for the Lord, working in ministry. Oh, I can't go to Bible study tonight. I got to work that second job. Why do you have a second job? Oh, well, we did that so we could you know, afford the lake cabin, or so we could get the other car, or so we could put the kids through school. You know what? I, I believe that even college education become, can become an idol. Uh, I believe that the diplomas and the degrees that we hang behind our heads when we're on Zoom calls, so everybody can be impressed with our, our advanced learning and our knowledge, that can become an idol when it becomes to, it's the thing that defines us. You know, who is Lee Arnold? 
If you answer that question, anything other than he's he's a man that loves Jesus and is on fire for the things of Christ. If that's not the answer, who is Lee Arnold? Then I've messed up because everything we do should be pointing to him, to his honor, to his glory. I am only who I am because of his mercies and his blessings and, and his wisdom and discernment. Outside of those things, I, I'm in big trouble, right? So what words do we use to define ourselves? Because in the words of definition, we could in those statements be creating idols around our, our successes, our accolades, our past endeavors. You know, I, I recently went to, well, it wasn't it was about a year ago, uh, we went to a, it was like a men's meeting. It was a, it was a day long meeting and it was dubbed as a marriage conference for men. Men, how do we be better, better husbands and fathers? And the gentleman that was teaching it spent a good seven hours walking us through his past sins, his past indiscretions, his past affairs in great detail. And it was disturbing. And I'm sitting here going, why does he keep telling us this story? And he broke it up into, you know, four sections with a break in between each. And it was like, wait, 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 wait. What, what is it we're bringing glory to? The story of your, your sexual conquest as, a, as an adulterer? Because so far, that's all I've heard about. Okay, great. You were saved radically by God. Let's talk about that. What's my point? I think sometimes we can make our past an idol when we talk about all the things we used to do, the sinful lifestyle that we used to lead. And we all have a testimony. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with bearing your testimony or sharing your past with people. But, you know, qualify. What, what are we trying to do here? Are we trying to lift ourselves up by telling people, you know, what a playboy we used to be or what a drunk we used to be or what a partier we used to be? Or are we, are we trying to set the stage to show people how much God has transformed us into who and what we are today, right? So it's that uh, my heart was black with sin uh, and, and Jesus made it white as snow, right? So that contrast story is great, but even the past can become an idol if we choose to, to make it our identity, the only identity I want is, is to be a lover of Jesus and a follower of Christ. That's it. Verse two, they stoop, they bow down together, unable to rescue the burden. They themselves go off into captivity. Verse three, listen to me, O house of Jacob, all you who remain of the house of Israel, you who I have upheld since you were conceived and have carried you since your birth. Rather than using beasts of burden to carry his people, the true and living God carries them himself all the days of their lives. His love is so enduring that he will care for us through our lifetime, even into death. Look at verse four, even to your old age and gray hairs. Now, this is covering everything literally from, from the moment you are conceived, not born, life begins at conception, from the moment you are conceived to the moment that you die. And all of the time in between, God is carrying you. He says, I am sustaining you. I will carry you. I will rescue you. See, only a, a living God is capable of saving us from anything. You know, that fancy car in the driveway is not going to save you. Not going to make sure you get to heaven. That luxury vacation is not going to save you. But a righteous and living God absolutely is. Verse 5, to whom will you compare me or count me equal? To whom will you liken me that we may be compared? Now, throughout history, people have tried to liken God to various things. The Greeks said, if I were God, I'd live on Mount Olympus, and I would be very powerful, and I would seduce pretty maidens. This is what the Greeks said. And so they created a god, and that's what their gods did all day. They would throw thunderbolts like Zeus, and they would chase women around. In other cultures, people said, if I were God, I would soar like eagles, I would make my gods into flying things, things that were capable of flying, because wouldn't it be great if we all could just, you know, flap our wings and fly around? You know what? If I'm going to create a god, I'm going to create a god that can fly, because I want to fly. So, hey, let's get a god that flies. Bottom line is people make gods out of what they think would be fun. But the problem is those gods become burdens. If your god is pleasure, you will be burdened with lust. If your god is money, you'll be in bondage to greed. And if your god is intellect, you'll be weighed down by pride. Boy, you know, top three, okay, pleasure, money, wealth, mammon, and knowledge. These are the three things that lead us into captivity. And, and when we allow those things in, when we make money our priority, 
we're heading down a, a very dangerous path. When we lead with all of my successes, my accolades, my degrees, all of the advanced learning that I've been through, all of the certificates that I carry, we are in pride. You know, we I'm guilty of this, right? Because of the for-profit nature of my business, uh, you guys have probably all seen what we call the sizzle reel, right? And it's all of the things of the past. And it's it's done specifically to build a platform of, okay, maybe I should listen to this guy, right? Maybe he knows what he's talking about. And so all of these visual images and loud talking and music is built to create an, an interest and a desire in people to listen. Wouldn't it be great if we could just stand up in front of a group of people without l listing or naming off anything we've done and simply say, I'm here today because I love Jesus. And that's all you need to know. Wouldn't that be awesome? But that's not how the world works. The world gives you more credit. They give you more, more of a platform. If you went to Harvard or Stanford or some Ivy League school, or you worked at some prominent company, or you held some prominent position, or you, you made some prominent salary, you know, you can't go to Facebook or anywhere on social media or the internet these days without seeing somebody sitting on the back of some jet with their name on it, like they've arrived. <laughs> Meanwhile, they're cussing like a sailor and no mention of God anywhere. Okay, great. You got a private jet. That's the jet that's going to fly you right into hell. Now, again, I don't want to overstep here. There's nothing wrong with having a jet. There's nothing wrong with having nice things. There's nothing wrong with having money. There's nothing wrong with having a big house. There's nothing wrong with any of that. Unless those things come to define you, if that is what you use to, to impress people, to define you, to build yourself up in the eyes of others, those things are idols. Verse 6, some pour out gold from their bags and weigh out silver on the scales. They hire a goldsmith to make it into a god, and they bow down and worship it. Can you imagine taking a stick taking it down to the goldsmith and saying, hey, could you please, you know, take this stick and I want you to put, give it arms and give it legs and give it a head. And then I want you to dip it in gold and uh, I'll come back and pick it up later. And so you go back and you pick up this stick figure that's now coated in gold and you bring it home and you stick it in a windowsill and you put candles and flowers all around it. And you build a shrine and then you sit in front of it and bow down to it and pray to it. Now, doesn't that seem kind of stupid? Yeah, it's really stupid. But yet, that's exactly what people were doing. And that's what God is saying. What, what, are, you, what are you thinking? Verse 7, they lift their shoulders and they carry it. Okay, now I got I to gotta take my little stick figure God. And I got to put it in my pocket. I got to take it everything, everywhere I go. Meanwhile, the God we serve lives inside of us through the power of the Holy Spirit. When we invite Jesus into our heart, the Holy Spirit just comes in. And you know what? I didn't weigh an ounce more when I invited the Holy Spirit into my life. So it's not a burden. It's not, it's not heavy. But yet they lift their shoulders to carry it, and they set it up in its place, and there it stands. And from that spot, it cannot move. It won't move unless somebody else moves it. No one cries out to it. It does not answer. It cannot save him from his troubles. Idols are worthless in the day of trial and tragedy. Not so true in the living God. Now, here's a question. Do we turn gold and silver into gods today? Isaiah was emphasizing the contrast between the one true God and idols made of material from the earth, like silver and gold. Now, we make idols out of what money buys, whether they are material things like houses, clothing, or cars, or intangibles. Now, here's some interesting intangibles. This is coming out of the question and study Bible, by the way. Some interesting intangibles, recognition, attention, and social standing. Have you ever thought of social standing as being a god? Or an idol? You know, you can't attend a business conference or a marketing conference about the importance of branding, right? When people see your brand, they've got to know what that represents and what that stands for. So we're, we're constantly trying to elevate ourselves that we have a more prominent social standing or the, that we are garnering more attention. There is a website right now. I'm trying to think of the name of it. It's like SB24. And what it does is it goes out into cyberspace and anytime your name or the name of your company is mentioned, right, it'll message you and it'll say, hey, somebody on, on this obscure website out in the middle of the nowhere is talking about you. You might want to talk, talk to him now. And so it's constantly alerting you when other people are talking about you. So if they're saying something negative, you can defend against. And if they're saying something positive, you can say, oh, great. Thank you. I appreciate that. But I mean, we're, we're so focused on our social standing. How do we look? You know, what are people saying about us? Recognition, attention. Idols can be anyone or anything that becomes more important to us than God. Now, I will tell you, 
that there are times that I question my very business. Now, many of you here know the business that we're in, right? We, we do real estate investment education. We do private money lending. We do loan servicing. We buy and fix houses. But those things consume far more of my time than my time in the word, my time in study, my time in service to the Lord. So where is there a healthy balance between being diligent in the business that God has placed us in or the job that God has us in, being being diligent to those responsibilities while still being mindful of our responsibilities as believers and what God has called us to do as it relates to the kingdom. Now, this is why I'm, I'm a big proponent and very adamant about business as a ministry. See, if I'm not, if I'm not sharing Christ through my business, then my business is an idol. If I'm sharing Christ through my business, then my business is a vehicle. And I would much rather be running a vehicle that is proclaiming and announcing the importance of a relationship with Jesus Christ than a business that is only focused on profits and recognition and social standing and attention. And it took me a lot of years to figure that out, right? So we're constantly trying to balance. And the Holy Spirit speaks to us and says, you're working too much. You're focusing too much on money. You're worrying too much about your bills. When do we get some time? When, when do we invest time for God? Well, what if we just did both, right? What if every moment we were in business, it was propelling the ministry and we were using it as an outlet to share Christ with others? That's something between you and the Lord. I mean, if you feel conviction around that topic, that's something you should be in prayer about and saying, Lord, have I overstepped? Has my business or my drive for money or my drive to, to elevate myself through the corporate ladder, is this getting in the way of a relationship with you? Verse eight, remember this, fix it in mind. Take it to heart, you rebels. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God. There is no other. I am God. There is none like me. Throughout scripture, God calls Old and New Testament believers alike to remember the work that God has already done on their behalf. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 15 says, and remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out, hence through mighty through his mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. First Chronicles 16, 11 and 12 says, seek the Lord and his strength, seek his face continually. Remember his marvelous works that he hath done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. Second Timothy chapter two, verse eight says this, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to the gospel. Seeing God's hand in the past encourages us to see his face in the present. And the Lord's timing is perfect. Delivery of his people was nearer than they could have imagined as they were sitting there in bondage and captivity in Babylon. Verse 10, I make it known. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. And I say, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. From the east, I summon a bird of prey. From a far off land, a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that will I bring about. What I have planned, that will I do. Now, Israel being caught up in captivity in the land of Babylon, they were tempted and they kept going back and forth. So they're under bondage. They're under captivity. They see the Babylonians that are incredibly wealthy. They've got all this money. They've got all these things and, and they're worshiping these idols. Now, if I see somebody else having success at something, I'm going to look and go, gee, what are they doing? Because it seems to be working. You know, they, they, they seem like they're doing pretty well. And so we start inquiring, hey, what are you doing? And then we find, up, find out that they're caught up in some type of business that verges or hinges on the side of illegal. And we think, well, you know, not that many people are getting hurt. I remember I was part of a mastermind a few years ago. And uh, this is back when cryptocurrency was still viewed as being okay, right? Nothing wrong with cryptocurrency in and of itself, but that's a, for you to decide. But as you guys recall, cryptocurrency was this big thing until Freed, Adam Freed and Sam Freed, uh, you know, goes from being worth $10 billion to being worth zero literally overnight. But there was this, this trend called pumping. And the way that pumping would work is you would buy this coin or this NFT, and then you would talk about it. So you and a group of friends or influencers, you would talk about it and you would pump it up. So you'd buy it at pennies, 
you'd talk about it, rave about it, write about it, and you'd pump it up. And then other people would buy based on your recommendations and you would pump the stock up or, or the coin up really high. And then you would sell it and then it would crash because now there's a sell off. So in this mastermind group, uh, we were having a session talking about crypto and everything else and, and we left. And then one of the women in the group sends an email and says, hey, I just found out about this new coin. Uh, we all should jump in and pump it up together and then we'll sell it. We all could make millions of dollars. And here, here's, what, here's how she closed the email. The great news is not very many people will get hurt. <laughs> not very many people will get hurt is what she said. <laughs> and I wrote back and I said, I'm sorry, guys, I, I cannot be a part of this group. Uh, any group that endorses this type of activity, I refuse to be associated with. I, 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 I want nothing to do with this. And I literally ended my membership in that group from that very email. I was done. And, you know, then it's, no, 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 no. That's not what I meant. I didn't mean it like that. You misunderstood me. It's like, I don't, wh whether I did or not, I don't care. The fact that you're even making suggestions that we should benefit and get rich by making others poor. I said, that doesn't sit well with me. Okay, now, if I were to look at, you know, this individual online and uh, I'd look and go, wow, she's very successful. She's done some amazing things. But how she did those things, how she became successful, you got to be very careful, right? These, these gurus that are driving around in Lamborghinis and Ferraris, do you really know how they made their money? You know what? Show me the guy that's driving around in a Pinto and has more joy than anyone that's the guy I want to follow, right? That that person, money has no bearing, no no concern. You know, they're just living for Jesus. That is what we should strive and desire to be like. Somebody that's just humbled before the Lord and, and everything else is just kind of dust in the wind. Again, the, I, I don't want to overstep. There's nothing wrong with things, you guys. There's nothing wrong with things. You got a beautiful home, great. God has blessed you, praise the Lord. You got money in the bank, great. God has blessed you. Praise the Lord. You got a brand new shiny car in the driveway. Great. God has blessed you. Praise the Lord. Where this becomes problematic is when we are spending all of our time to make the payments on those things or to save up the money to buy and afford those things that there's no time for Christ. There, there's no there's no time to be in the word. There's no time for Bible studies or home study groups or attending church on Sunday mornings. Those things have taken priority. That's an idol. So Israel is seeing the success of the Babylonians and thinking, hey, maybe these, you know, this, this God of Baal, maybe this, there's something we said about this, or maybe Nebo really is the God of science and learning. So they start leaning this direction. And Isaiah affirms, here's what he's doing. He's affirming the sole lordship of God. He's saying, guys, God is it. You, you don't need anything else. There isn't anything else. This is what you got. God is unique in his knowledge and in his control of the future. His consistent purpose is to carry out what he has planned. I, I like that. His consistent purpose is to carry out what he has planned. Isn't that great? When we are tempted to pursue anything that promises pleasure, comfort, peace, or security apart from God, we must remember our commitment to God. Bottom line is this. God is in control. There is no other. The, the phrase declaring the end from the beginning signifies that God is omnipotent, on, on, omnipotent, on, omniscient, uh, which is all-knowing. And he can declare how history will end because he will actively intervene in the world to accomplish his plan for all the nations. Verse 12, listen to me, you stubborn-hearted, you who are far from righteousness. I am bringing my righteousness near. It is not far away, and my salvation will not be delayed. I will grant salvation to Zion and my splendor to Israel. Now, here's the, here's the thing to underline. My salvation will not be delayed. This is what the Lord declares through Isaiah. And he said the same thing concerning the vision he gave to Habakkuk, uh, another of his prophets. Habakkuk 2, chapter 2, verse 3 says this, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. This is in, in reference to the salvation that the Lord brings to each and every one of us. Chapter 47. It's a record. I think we just made it through a chapter in like 25 minutes. Unbelievable. Praise the Lord. Verse 40, chapter 47. 
Now, in chapter 46, we see the gods of Babylon, right? This is what's causing the problem. Now we come to chapter 47, and this is titled The Fall of Babylon. Now, this deals with the destruction of Babylon, who at this time was just a power that was just coming into prominence. Now, remember that Isaiah wrote this 150 years before Cyrus came in and destroyed Babylon. Now, as Isaiah is writing this, Babylon is just this tiny little town. Uh, it, it, it's not the world leader by any means. I mean, let's let's go back and think of America in the late 1700s, early 1800s. It's just this tiny little colony, you know, that the British aren't really even concerned with because eh, it's just a few people living on the other side of the ocean. We don't need to worry about them. That's kind of how Babylon was when Isaiah is writing this. So for anybody living at the time that Isaiah is writing this, they would be looking at it going, Babylon? Babylon's just a little tiny sea town on the, on the river. What's, what, what does Babylon have to do with anything? Well, then Babylon is the vehicle that God uses to punish his people. But Babylon will fall by the hand of Cyrus, the leader of the Medes and the Persians. Now, here in verse 1, Isaiah is predicting the fall of Babylon. Again, more than 150 years before it happened. Babylon has not emerged yet as a world power. And it was almost a century before it would become a world power. So 100 years before it would become a world power is when this is being written. Now, Babylon, and I did not know this, had been in existence since the days of the Tower of Babel and had influenced the world religiously. Babylon was also the fountainhead and the mother of all idolatry. Now, when you think of it in those terms, okay, oh, God, look, look what God's doing. He's taking the very thing that for hundreds of years has been viewed as kind of the, the mountain on the hill, the pinnacle of knowledge, the pinnacle of religion, the pinnacle of sorcery and magic. And he's going to use it to punish his people who have turned their back on him. All through the Old Testament books of prophecy, a great deal is said about drunkenness and idolatry. These are the two things that will bring the downfall of any nation. And here's what we see in Verse chapter 47. Now, verse one says, go down, sit in the dust, virgin daughter. Now, virgin here simply means that Babylon had never been conquered. That's why it said says virgin daughter of Babylon. However, the prophet warned that she would be removed from her throne and made to sit in the dust. The virgin daughter of Babylon says, sit on the ground without a throne, daughter of Babylonians. No more will you be called tender and delicate. Now, the language here is coming from Jeremiah chapter 50 and 51, and what it's doing is it's stripping down Babylon to reveal her nakedness. Now, nakedness is sin, and it depicts great shame to come. Again, Jeremiah 50 and 51, uh, Jeremiah prophesies the same fall of Babylon. Now, I want you to think about this, okay? Now, we know that Cyrus, and this is through history, we know that Cyrus read the book of Isaiah, and he sees his name. And he sees the method through which he will capture and destroy Babylon. So, you know, you think of Cyrus. And, and we read last week, uh, chapter 45, verse 1, it says, This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of, to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so the gates will not be shut. Right? So you're you're Cyrus. And, and you're reading this and going, I, I, I think this is about me. How could this guy named Isaiah, who I've never met, who's dead, how could he know me? You know, the way that we can prove God's existence is through prophecy, right? The, the Bible prophesies all these things that have already occurred. So here's Cyrus reading this prophecy, and he's going, I'm Cyrus. Huh, how did my name get in there? And then it goes on to say that he will have no problems defeating the Babylonians, that God will aid him. God will deliver to Cyrus the nation of Babylon, the confidence that he must have had knowing that the God of creation that had anointed him to subdue nations before him was with him, which means he couldn't lose. You know, and I started thinking about that. What would happen if, you know, I was reading my Bible and, and my name popped up there and it said, Lee Arnold, you're going to do da 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 because now I can move forward fearlessly. And so I Googled this word. I Googled God's promises. God's promises. And 
there were over 365 of them. And I was like, hey, that's pretty cool. One promise per day of every day of the year. But I, I just took the top 10 that popped up. Here are God's promises. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, we will have perfect peace in him. If you don't have peace about something this morning, that's not from God. Because the Bible says that we will have perfect peace. And if the Bible says that Cyrus can defeat Babylon, certainly the Bible says we can have perfect peace. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10 says he will lift us up. Feeling blue this morning, feeling low. That's not from the Lord. That, that's from Satan. God will lift us up. You need to be in prayer about whatever it is that's causing you to have depression or to be feeling low today. That's not what God has for us. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 8 says he will never leave us nor forsake us. He's with us at all times, everywhere we go. Psalms chapter 32, verse 8 says he will teach us nothing we need to know that he can't teach us. And I always, I've always been fascinated by the way God puts mentors in our lives, and he allows our paths to cross with certain people at just the right moment in time so that we can learn a skill that will hopefully one day in the future be a blessing or, or to bring glory to the Lord. You know, we're, we're now putting on the largest Christian conference in the Pacific Northwest this year at the Bold Conference. And I, I got into the seminar business because I was watching an infomercial back in 1995, and God crossed my paths with, an, with a, a seminar company. And now we're putting, and we have been for years, putting on seminars, but now we're putting on the biggest Christian conference in the Inland Northwest, which is really exciting because without God teaching me how to do that, I would have known. You guys have knowledge that if you go back and think of the person who taught it to you, God brought you, he crossed your paths with that person. Isn't that cool? Anything God needs you to know, he will cross, have you cross paths with somebody or something so that you can learn that thing. But understand, he wants you to learn that thing so you can do it and use it for his glory, not yours. Psalm chapter 37, verse 23 and 24 says this, while we may stumble, he will never let us fall. We can't fail, you guys. We can't, we can't lose. We can stumble. You know, we might lose the game, but we will win the war. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, 29 says, we will always find rest in him. You shouldn't be having sleepless nights. Sleepless nights are the cause of worry. Why do we worry when God's already told us the outcome? What is it we're so worried about? Second Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10 says, he will strengthen us. You don't think you have the strength to do it? Your strength doesn't come from you. Your strength comes from the Lord. He will strengthen us. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19 says he will meet all of our needs. You've been whining to God, God, I need this, God, I need that. You got everything you need. Think about that. There's nothing that you need that you don't have. Philippians 4, 19 says he will meet all of our needs. You got all the things you need. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8 says that God will give us abundant blessings. Now, this is just 10 there's 365 of them, and I would challenge you all to Google them. All I did, I Googled God's promises, God's promises from the Bible, 365, okay? Now, you could get one. Somebody should take them and like create a, a devotional book, one, one Promise of God Every Day. That'd be pretty cool. If it doesn't already exist, I'm sure that it does. I haven't seen it. But Cyrus confidently moved forward in boldness to take Babylon because the Bible said that God would deliver Babylon into his hands. We, too, should be moving forward and advancing the gospel in boldness because God told us that he's going to give us peace and rest. He's going to lift us up. He's going to educate us. While we'll stumble, he'll never let us fall. We'll find our rest. We'll find our strength. He'll meet all our needs, and he will give us abundant blessings. Oh. How is it possible for a Christian to be afraid or, 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 or worried or sad or, or depressed? I get it, right? Bad things happen. Things that we thought were going to take place didn't, so we're disappointed. That's, that's not God dropping the ball. That's God simply saying, that was not my will for you. That's, that's not the direction I wanted you to go. So I didn't provide the resources. I didn't provide the mentors or the people. I, I didn't want you to learn that skill set. That's why that didn't succeed. I didn't want it to. If God wants you to be successful at something, guess what? You will be. If you have not been in the past, it's because God didn't want that for you. Maybe not then. I don't know. Maybe now. But that's something certainly to be in prayer about. God was, or Cyrus was confident in taking Babylon because he had written 150 years earlier in his word exactly how Cyrus would do it. We see that in the book of Daniel. And that he would succeed. God has given us his word written thousands of years before our birth with the same direction and confidence in our success. Why then would we ever doubt or worry? Does that make any sense? 
Now, I want to pause here momentarily. If you are depressed this morning, if you are worried this morning, it doesn't make you a bad person, doesn't make you a bad Christian, simply means that you probably need to go back and check your theology. I have bad days, right? I have days that I'm just frustrated and annoyed and depressed and worried, and I got to go back to God's promises. He will never leave me nor forsake me. He'll never give me more than I can bear. He'll, though I stumble, he won't let me fall. He'll, he'll give me the strength. He'll rise me up on wings of eagles, right? We got to go back to the, the fundamental truths because Satan wants to discourage us. Have you ever met a discouraged pastor? They're out there. Are they having an effect for the kingdom? What would their effect be like if they weren't discouraged, if they were operating under the power of the Holy Spirit? Satan loves to whisper in our ear and say, you don't deserve that. Or he'll say, you deserve that. You need to go work harder. You need to go make lots of money so you can buy really nice things. That's, that's coming from Satan. That is not from the Lord. Verse 2, take millstones and grind flour. Take up your veil. Lift up your skirts. Bear your legs and wade through the streams. Your nakedness will be exposed and your shame uncovered. I will take vengeance. I will spare no one. Our Redeemer, the Lord Almighty, is his name, is the Holy One of Israel. The only safety in a world under judgment is the Lord himself who acts for the sake of his people. Verse 45, sit then in silence, go into darkness, daughter of the Babylonians. No more will you be called queen or kingdoms. I was angry with my people and desecrated. I was angry with my people and desecrated my inheritance. I gave them into your hand, and you showed them no mercy. Even on the aged, you laid a very heavy yoke. Here's what God is saying here. He's speaking to Babylon. He's saying, guys, you were arrogant. You were lifted up. You were careless. You were not believing that a frightful nightfall was coming. Do you guys remember Nebuchadnezzar, the, the Babylonian king? He looked out over his beautiful city, and he said this. He says, look at the beautiful city I have built. Look at the beautiful city I have built. Now, if you guys haven't seen it yet, uh, you need to go see it. And that is called the Jesus Revolution. Uh, this is the story about uh, Calvary Chapel and Chuck Smith and Greg Laurie and Lonnie Frisbee and kind of the, the founding of the hippie movement. Uh, great movie. If you haven't seen it, please go see it. And a uh, quick shameless plug, praise the Lord, Greg Laurie is going to be at the Bold Conference this October. Uh, we couldn't be more excited to have him. But there's a moment in the movie where Lonnie Frisbee, who's kind of joined forces with Chuck Smith at Calvary Chapel, he starts taking credit for the growth of the church. He starts saying, well, it's because of what I've done. It's because of me. And boy, you, uh, chills kind of went through my back as I was watching this scene unfold because it's like, uh-oh, <laughs> uh-oh, he's taking credit for what God is doing. And he's saying, it's me. And that was the beginning of the downfall for Lonnie Frisbee. Now, the movie doesn't tell this, but if you, if you investigate, you can Google Lonnie Frisbee and what you'll find is from the moment he made that statement, it was a downhill trog. Uh, he moved to Florida from Southern California. He got caught up in the homosexual movement, became an active homosexual, and died of AIDS in 1993. Why? Because he was taking credit for what God was doing through him. If you guys ever, ever hear me say anything even remotely suggestive, that anything that's happening through the ministry or the business or the conference, that I had anything whatsoever to do with it, Please send me a, an email and say, Lee, you are you are you are on the wrong side of that line. The ice you're standing on is very thin. Ugh, you know you can't mess with that, right? This is this is God's planet. This these are God's people, and if He uses us and we are privileged enough to be used by Him, give Him the glory. Because if you don't, it's not going to end well. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar is doing. Look at the great and glorious and beautiful city that I've built. And you guys remember the story? The moment he said that. He got down on all fours and he crawled out of his palace and he spent the next seven years eating grass like an ox. He went nuts. And that was God's judgment upon him. Verse seven. You said, I will continue forever, the eternal queen, but you did not consider these things or reflect on what might happen. Now then listen, you wanton creature lounging in your security and saying to yourself, I am, and there's none besides me. I will never be a widow or suffer the loss of children. Both of these will overtake you in a moment. On a single day, both loss of children and widowhood, they will come upon you in full measure in spite of your many sorceries and all your potent spells. 
so many kingdoms before her and after her, Babylon thought itself invincible. Yet in a single night, she fell to the invasion of Cyrus and was thus rendered both widowed and childless due to the loss of king and the loss of life. Now, here's a thought. Arguably, I use that term loosely, America is the greatest superpower in the world. Now, I believe that's a surface truth that Americans just like to say so they can feel comfortable. But, and I don't want to start a conspiracy theory by, by any means, but I'm of the opinion that China has troops and warfare and warheads and military capacity that we don't even know about. I believe that. And America is prideful. America is caught up in, in its own idolatry, just like Babylon. And we continue to push God out of every area of our lives. Many don't think that anything could happen to America the way it happened in Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, saw, Nebuchadnezzar thought the same thing the night before his ruler of the world status was taken away. Now, we can be grateful that the Lord has his hand on America because without it, we could suffer the same fate as Babylon. Now, in all of our advanced military capability, jumbo jets were able to fly into the side of the buildings completely undetected, completely unknown, and attack America and fly into two of the most prominent buildings in America. How are we not susceptible to that happening again? Now, I believe that that was God's warning shot. I do. Because literally, you guys, one nuclear weapon, you know, dropped in the middle of Washington, D.C. or in, in the middle of Manhattan. I mean, it's lights out, right? But in America, there's this, there's this arrogance that you can't touch us. We're America, red, white, and blue. Babylon was the same way. You know what? I'm sure they had a bunch of flag-wearing, beer-drinking, part of your country Western singers that were all pontificating the same thing. But here we are in America. I believe the only reason America has not already been taken over and put into captivity is because America continues to defend Israel. Babylon was against Israel. America is still predominantly for Israel. And I believe that as long as America continues to protect and have good relationships with Israel, that God will continue to have his hand on America. But if we at any moment say, you know what, Israel, you're on your own. Good luck. Huh. America's going down. I really believe that's true. You cannot look at what's going on in Babylon and what's happening today in America and not see similarities. I mean, it's like identical. Verse eight, verse nine, both of these will overtake you in a moment on a single day, loss of children and widowhood. They will come upon you in full measure in spite of your many sorceries and all of your potent spells. The Babylonians thought they were on top of every situation and they thought that no one saw them. Now, the atheist still holds this view. Atheist claims that they can't see God. But the reason that they don't find God any more than a thief looks to find a policeman. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13 says this, You shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart, the Lord declared. Now, if you had just recently robbed a bank, right? And you had duffel bags filled with cash. Probably the last place you're going to go is the police precinct down the road and go hobnob with a bunch of people in blue, right? You're probably not going to do that. Well, if you're not looking for a cop, it's going to be harder to find a cop, right? And why aren't you looking for a cop? Because there's something going on in your life or you know you've done something where you don't want to see a cop. The atheist is no different. The atheist is not looking for God. They don't believe in God. They don't believe there is a God. So they're not looking for him. So this promise in Jeremiah 29, 13 says this, you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Now, I believe the reason that God allows calamities to take place when God allows us to go through some pretty terrible situations, I believe it's him getting our attention so that we will seek with all of our heart. And in those moments, we will come to know him as Lord and Savior. Uh, that's his heart. God doesn't want anybody to perish, but that all would come to a full acceptance of him. God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. Well, I don't believe in him. Well, you should, because the Bible talks about it constantly. And for those that don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, when they die, they go to hell. It's, it's not gray, you guys. There's no gray area in this. It's pretty black and white. Either you are walking in the light, and you're going to spend eternity in heaven, or you're walking in the black, the dark, and you're going to go to hell. Being a good person is not going to save you. 
being kind to others and donating to charity is not going to get you into heaven. It's only when you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that you have the promise of an eternity in heaven. Verse 10, you have trusted in your wickedness and you have said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and knowledge mislead you. When you say to yourself, I am, and there's none besides me, disaster will come upon you and you will not know how to conjure it away. A calamity will fall upon you that you cannot ward off with a ransom. A catastrophe you cannot foresee will suddenly come upon you. It's going to happen, right? God's going to do everything he can to get your attention, to shake you, to rattle you, to get you to move, to get you off of center. You know, some of you listening right now, you may not be a believer. And you're wondering, how in the world did you even end up here right now in this moment listening to this? Why? Well, something's going on in your life that is making you uncomfortable, that's making you worried, that's causing you fear, concern. And you're kind of looking for answers. You're, you're, you're trying to figure it out. And somehow, miraculously, God has landed you here this, to bring you catastrophe that you cannot see, a calamity that you cannot ward off with a ransom. Nothing you can do in your own power to solve it. I believe that cancer, the unsolvable thing, and you know, you see so many people raising money to fight cancer, to cure cancer, and billions and billions and billions of dollars, cancer has yet to be cured. How is that possible? We are the, the most advanced version of our species that has ever lived, and yet we can't cure this disease. Why? Maybe God doesn't want it cured. You ever thought about that? Why wouldn't God want cancer cured? Because I believe cancer has led more people to seek and find Christ than anything else. All the churches on every street corner in the world. Somebody gets cancer, doesn't know God, doesn't walk with God, doesn't believe in God, and suddenly they're diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer, and suddenly... I, I need to make sure my life is right spiritually. I believe cancer is driving people to the cross, driving people to seek out God. It's not just cancer. I mean, it's anything. It's, it's, it's pick something, right? A divorce can drive people to find God. An automobile accident can drive people to find God. Battle in the military can find, drive people to find God. Whatever it is, God's going to use it to get your attention. Believe, God does not want you to live a, a painful life. But if that's what's required for you to come to know him as Lord and Savior, then that's what he's going to do. It may not be you. It may, it may give cancer to a spouse or a loved one or, or, or a friend. And you're going, why would, a, why would a loving God allow this to happen? Because until it happened, you didn't even say the word God. He's bringing it upon them to get your attention. You need to be right with Jesus Christ. Verse 13, all the counsel you have received has only worn you out. Let your astrologers come forward, those stargazers who make predictions month by month. Astrologers, they believed that they had the heavens, that the heavens were divided into 12 sections, the signs of the zodiac, and the movement of the heavenly bodies determined the destinies and the, where, the welfare of people and nations. You guys remember the, hey, what's your sign, man? They were doing the same thing thousands of years ago in Babylon. That's not something new. The hippies did not come up with, what's your sign? All right. Babylon did. They were the foundation of astrology and sorcery. They were caught up in all of these things. The Babylonians' attempts to read and manipulate the future to their advantage would be thwarted by God. This pseudoscience is as an antithetical to biblical faith today as it was then. Sorcery is not going to save you. Your horoscope, not going to save you. Verse 12, or verse 14. Surely they are like stubble. The fire will burn them up. They cannot even save themselves from the power of the flame. Here are no coals to warm anyone. Here there is no fire to sit by. The only fire is the one burning the city of Babylon. That is all they can do for you. These you have labored with and trafficked with since childhood. Each of them goes on in his error. There is none, there is not one that can save you. The people of Babylon sought advice from astrologers and stargazers, but like the idols of wood and gold, astrologers could not have even delivered themselves from what was to come from the hand of God. Why rely on those who are powerless? The helpless cannot help us. Alternatives to God are destined to fail. If you want help, find it in God who has proven his power in creation and in history. So what's the application to all of this? Here's the application. 
There is no one like God. He knows the beginning from the end. He knew you at conception. He knows you now with gray hair, and he'll know you until you die. We don't know what each day will bring. And even with modern technology, we can hardly get tomorrow's weather forecast right, let alone predict the future. Only an omnipotent God can reveal the future, and only the Bible contains thousands of fulfilled prophecies, proving it divine in its inspiration. Charles Spurgeon said this, It is a truth beyond dispute that God's justice is not partial, and that the description of the destruction he awards to one class of sinners is a most fair picture of what he will do with others. For God has two or three ways of dealing with men in his justice. He judges through his righteousness, and he awards vengeance to impotent people by an established and invariable rule. For us today, the ruin of Babylon is a representation and a metaphorical description of the destruction that will surely come on impotent sinners in that day when the Lord Jesus returns from heaven to judge his enemies and to rid himself of his adversaries. What Charles Spurgeon is saying here is what we see happening to Babylon is exactly what is going to happen to this earth in the end times. God is going to come in and everything is going to be destroyed. And if you know him, you will be saved. If you don't know him, you will be destroyed. The ungodly find comfort in their unbelief. Yet there is a God who sees all, and he is perfect and holy and will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing. So in closing, here's our closing. It's short. For those of us that have a personal relationship with Jesus and are walking with him, praise the Lord. Share with everyone you meet. For those of you who have never given your life over to Christ, don't let another second of the clock tick without asking him to be your Lord and Savior. We all need to be mindful that the end is coming. You know, and I don't want to be a doom and gloomer, but you, you, you got to recognize that God is moving. God is living and God is watching and God is righteous and he's holy. And he needs you to make a decision. Are you for him or are you against him? The Bible says that he would rather you be hot or cold, not lukewarm. You know, if you've been a Christian, you know, you're saved, you got saved when you were a kid, but for the past decade or so, there's not really anything in your life that would suggest that you love Jesus, that you, you want to please him and honor him. Because everything you've done up to this point has been for your benefit, for your glory, for your advancement, for your desires. If you are that backslidden, lukewarm Christian, you need to make a new commitment today. That starting today, I'm going to be on fire for Jesus. I'm going to live for him. I'm going to, I'm going to praise him and worship him and honor him and glorify him. And I'm going to get up in the morning to serve him. But if you don't have a relationship with him at all, then you wake up every morning in hopes and dreams and wonders. You've got no savior. That's terrible. Well, the good news is you are one prayer away from inviting Jesus into your heart, from having him as your Lord and savior. The thief on the cross, I believe in you, Lord. That's all he had to say. The Lord says to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. I was listening to, um, oh, I don't remember his, his name, but he was talking about that very thing. Uh, and when this thief on the cross got to heaven, right? The, the Lord says, today you'll be, you'll be with me in paradise. And the thief on the cross dies and goes to heaven. And he was going through what the conversation must have been like when this guy got there. you know. And you've got all of these pastors and preachers that kind of circle around this thief on the cross who's now in heaven. And they're saying, so when did you get baptized? And the guy says, I didn't get baptized. And they, well, well, which church were you a member of? Because I never went to a church. Oh, um, well, what good things or good deeds did you do? I was a thief until the moment I said those words, I died, and now I'm here. It, it, you know, it just boggles people's minds. Wait a minute. It can't, it can't be that easy. It is. All you need to do is acknowledge that God is the creator of the universe, that his son Jesus came to this earth, died on the cross as a forgiveness of your sins. And by acknowledging that and inviting the Holy Spirit, Jesus to come to your heart, make him a Lord and Savior, you spend eternity in heaven. There's no works of righteousness. There's no church membership. There's no baptism requirement. None of those things. You simply need to accept him, receive him, follow him. That's it.
So if that's you this morning, if you have never invited Jesus into your heart, made him your Lord and Savior, let's not let another second of this day go by without inviting him in. So if you'd like to invite Jesus into your heart this morning, I want you to bow your head. Let's pray together. For those of you that already know Christ, be in prayer for those that don't. For those of you that know Christ, but you have been walking with him, maybe today is a rededication for you. But let's bow our heads. Let's pray together. Lord, we're so grateful for all that you have done and all that you're doing. Lord, I thank you for this story here in chapters 46 and 47 about idols and Babylon. And Lord, we see the parallels. We see how much that America has become like Babylon as we we have our idol worship. And Lord, we're just so focused on all of the unimportant things. Lord, we want to walk with you. We want to follow you all the days of our lives. And Lord, we want everything we do to be in your will and in your power as you lead and guide and direct. And Lord, there's a few friends here today that have never invited you into their heart. They've never asked you to be their Lord and Savior. And Lord, I I just pray that right now in this moment that you would fill that void that's in their heart. The thing that they've been looking for, Lord, help them to understand that this is it. And if that's you, I want you to say this prayer. Simply say, Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner and I have sinned against you. And I acknowledge that you died on the cross. I acknowledge that your blood covers my sin, and from it, I have total and complete forgiveness. And I believe on the third day you rose again, and I believe that you're in heaven now. And just say, I invite you to come into my heart and say, I make you my Lord and my Savior. Lord, I pray for the people that said that prayer in this moment. Lord, I thank you that you have brought things into their life, calamities and challenges and difficulties and circumstances, Lord, that brought them to hear this message. Lord, I thank you for your holiness and your faithfulness in bringing them to the word. And Lord, that now they have you living inside of them. What a, what a tremendous blessing and privilege and honor. And if you said that prayer this morning, you've been born again. Jesus has come into your life and he'll walk with you and he'll lead you and he'll guide you. Lord, I just pray that you would help them find a local church family, a local fellowship, that they can they can learn more about your word, that you can plug them in, Lord, that people would come alongside them and help them live out their faith in you. Lord, for those that know you but haven't been walking with you, Lord, I, I pray that today would be the, the beginning of a new day where we make our lives yours, we make our time yours, we make our desire yours, and Lord, that we just live out our faith for you. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. We're so grateful. We love you, Lord. We commit all these things to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you said that prayer this morning, we have a gift for you. Uh, it's a new believers package. If we could send that to you, just put into the chat uh, or message us through Facebook and just say, I, I invited Jesus into my heart this morning. Um, and we're not going to make a spectacle out of you. We're not going to announce it. We're not going to publish it anywhere. Uh, we simply want to send you a new believers kit comes with the Bible and a devotional and uh, some other resources that you can use. And also, if you would like help finding a local church uh, that is God-believing, Bible teaching that you can plug into, uh, we have resources to find churches in your area that are going to teach verse by verse, line by line, uh, so that you can get a better understanding of God's word through the Bible. So if we can help you in any way, please let us know. You can call us at 800-461-0216. Again, 800-461-0216. Uh, you can also reach us on our website at he's the solution.com uh, or on Facebook at he's the solution.com. Also, just want to remind everybody and invite you all October 13, 14, and 15 uh, here in Spokane, Washington, the Be Bold for Jesus Conference fifth annual. Love to have you join us for that. Go to bb4j.com for tickets. All right. Well, may the Lord richly bless you this week as you live your life out for him. Be in prayer about what it is he would have you to do. Uh, And every day, you know, when you wake up in the morning, just say, Lord, please put somebody in my path today that I can share you with. Watch what he does. Well, until next time, God bless you guys. Have a great rest of your day. It's spring, right? We sprung forward this morning. So you get an extra hour of sunlight tonight. So enjoy it. Use it wisely. God bless you guys. We'll see you here next week. Lord willing. Goodbye, everybody. 